All right, so um, as I mentioned earlier, we are in a sermon series, and I don't usually do the sermon series, but this this is a scripture that I felt like this is the one God want, really want us to hear and hold on to. So that's what we're trying to do. We are trying to dig into this specific passage that we find from 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 to 9. And um, and we should give extra attention to this scripture because we know what we are going through right now. We Smith Chapel, you know, we are we are we are you know in the process of making crucial um, decision. And as you know, next Sunday we'll make we will take a second vote uh, whether we will discipline it from the UMC or not. So it's very crucial, and there must be a reason why God has given us this word. And we all know that. And we believe, you know, God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So I want all of us to give our extra attention, like, God, show us your light from this word. You know? And not only showing us, you know, the pathway, but also Holy Spirit help us so that we can walk on that pathway. I think that's, you know, maybe more important. Not only seeing the right pathway, but walking on that pathway. Amen. So let me begin with a recap from last Sunday. <clears throat> so does anyone remember what I preached last Sunday? <laughs> Maybe I asked the wrong question, right? <laughs> so I covered verses three to five. Yeah, remember? So I, you know, it was about the source of a reason that Christians can joyful can be joyful. And verse six starts with the last one. In this we rejoice, and in this, you know, it includes. All the you know the previous verses that you see from three to five, um, you know which you have heard that God's great mercy, you know that has caused us to be born again, which lead us to a living hope, not the dead hope, in and through Jesus Christ who was risen from dead, and which also lead us to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So I'm sure you will remember now, you know some of these things. And I also preached last Sunday that you are being guarded, protected by God's power. And as I explained last Sunday, this power, this God's protection is not only from the attack from outside, but also something, the greatest enemy inside. You know, he's holding you, he's sustaining you so that you won't be escaping from his kingdom. You won't be neglecting his, this inheritance that is kept for you in heaven. And and by which you will have this full salvation you know, when Jesus Christ comes again. So Peter says, in this, okay, in all this, you rejoice. Meaning that in this God's great mercy, you know, that has been given out for your salvation, you rejoice. In the fact that God worked so hard, you know, out of his love and compassion to give you eternal life, you rejoice. That's what Peter is saying. And this heavenly joy you know, comes to the heart when we truly sense and realize how much God loves us. You know, when was your last time you felt this great love, this great mercy, and you feel like you're asking these questions like, why God? Who am I, Lord, what, that you so much loving me? Like, who am, what, what did I do, Lord, you know, to give me this great mercy? You know? Having that sense of awe and, you know, and, and that heart can give you, unleash an exceeding joy in your heart. So last Sunday, um, I also mentioned that your salvation come through your faith. So even though God has given all these things, uh, unless you respond with the right heart, unless you really believe in it, you know, God so loved the world, he gave only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish. But if you don't believe in him, well, you cannot have this eternal life that God has given you. So this believing or having faith, you know, and we committing our lives you know, holistically to Jesus, we say that's repentance. We make the season to turn around from our sins we make the decision to die to our sins, but make Jesus Christ alive in us. And that's what it means to repent and having faith in Jesus. So in a nutshell, uh, having faith 
matters in your faith, in your, I mean, having faith is matters in your salvation. That's what you heard last Sunday. So today we'll be focusing on verses six and seven, only two verses. And I'm telling you, it will challenge your faith. It will challenge your faith, which it did to me. And we need that challenge today. You know, we need to make our faith alive, refurbish our faith, because again, having real faith matters because without real faith you cannot have real salvation so this is i wanted to um, i wanted us to do today so we will dive into these two verses and taste and see what the lord has in store for us so let's read verse six six and seven one more time okay can we read together one two three in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. First, I want to look at verse 6 first. And here you'll find two mismatching or unsuitable words placed together. One is rejoice, another is grieve, grieving. So you may wonder, like, how come joy and grief can go together? It's like you're angry. At the same time, you're peaceful. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, does, it doesn't make sense. But when you really think about it, this paradoxical condition reflects the reality of Christian life. Because Christians can suffer greatly. And our lives can be filled with difficulties that can agonize our lives, our hearts. Because we are living in this fallen world, and yet we still can be joyful. Why? Because of our conviction of our salvation in Jesus Christ. In that respect, someone said, you know, um, our life today is a school in which God trains us for our future ministry in eternity. Therefore, the presence of trials, whatever it is, is our lives, in our lives, are God's tools and textbooks. Having faith in Jesus does not mean that you somehow have this magically, you're, you're, you can have this stress-free life. Now, in most cases, coming to Jesus may not blow away all your miserable circumstances. Sometimes, even like when you start following Jesus, you know, somehow your life get more complicated. Your know, life get involved with more challenges. But what Jesus offers to you once you start following him and believing in him, worshiping him, is that he gives you the best gift. That is the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit can give you a new heart, new spirit, new strength, and new eyes so that you can live above your circumstances and keep trusting in God to believe that God is always good and right, by which you will have this unshakable joy in your heart that's the power of Christian joy. And William Barclay said, we Christians are chosen for joy. However hard the Christian way, it is both in the traveling and in the gold, the way of joy. There is always a joy in doing the right thing. The Christian is the man and woman of joy. The Christian is the laughing cavalier of Christ. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms and nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its connection with black clothes and long faces. So how about we make some big smile, nice smile to God and to one another? Like, you know, God, thank you. Like, God is watching you. God is seeing your face right now. Man, how about we give some joy, you know, our gladness and God, thank you. So regarding trials trials, Peter gives us five lessons that we should learn, and that will be our main focus today. So what Peter says about trials, number one, he says, for a little while. Peter says, our trials only last for a little while. It's a little while compared to eternity. So this littleness could be a week. This littleness could be a year or even lifelong. It may last long here on earth. But hear me this, in Christ, your suffering won't last forever. 
They are there just for a season. All your sufferings will go away, wash away, melt away when our king returns. Amen. Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. When Jesus Christ comes back, your, all your sufferings will be gone. That's why it's a little while sometimes, even though sometimes we feel like, you know, it's going forever. Second, Peter says, if necessary, it means God allows special trials for some occasions. I know one of the wrestling questions for every human being is why God allows suffering. There are multiple ways to unearth this mystery. But at least from this passage, we learn God allows sufferings for training purposes. And I want to think about Israelites for a moment. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years. 40 years. That's a long time. They were in the wild. It was tough. It was dangerous. It was hard. They have been homeless for 40 years. And I'm sure they must have wrestled with this question. Why God? You know? Why so long? What's your plan? What's your purpose in this? And we also wonder as a third eyes, with third eyes, why God put them in the wilderness for 40 years after he's shown them this wonders and, you know, this miracles, pulling them out of the hands of Egypt, Egyptians. Why God? And we get two answers. Number one is frog. Can you say with me frog? meaning fully rely on God. Before entering into the promised land, this is what God wanted. You know, God wanted to train his people to learn how to fully rely on God so that they may say, God, you know what? I don't need anything else but you. God, you know what? I don't want to worship anything else but, uh, but you. And I'm holding on to you alone. I don't want to hold on to anything else. You know what? You matter the most. I don't care about anything else. But I care about you alone. God wanted his people becoming more and more relying on him fully and completely while they were in the wilderness. Number two, holy, meaning having our lives yielded to God. Think about this. These people were spent generation after generation in Egypt. They were there more than 400 years. That's more than American history. That's a long time. So whether they liked it or not, or whether they try to accept it or not, their mindset, their perspective, their lifestyles were contaminated by these pagan cultures. So it was God's heart to purify them before letting them enter in the promised land. Make them holy as God is holy. So while they were in the wilderness, we, we know that God was giving them Ten Commandments. God was giving them ritual laws. You know, ceremonial laws, in which all serves were what? To be holy and pure. And so all those years in the wilderness were not a waste of time. It was, you know, God so delicately and pur purposefully, you know, leading their pathways, leading them so that they can be pure. They can be holy. They be able to fully rely on God. Third, this is what Peter says about trials. He said it's grieving trials. The adjective Peter used for trials is grieving. Grieving in Greek word is uh, lepeo, meaning heaviness, make sorrowful, or to experience grief or pain. The same word was used for Jesus, you know, when he was in Gethsemane. You know, he was greatly troubled in his heart. No, by the impending crucifixion. And he was in great anguish and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So even though we are associating the word grieving with rejoicing together, but we have to be careful not to diminish the pains we may suffer from our trials. Grieving is heavy. Suffering is suffering Pain is painful. Death is death. It's devastating. Nevertheless, we still can be joyful. Why? Because 
the joy that comes from the Lord is way more powerful, amen? Way more greater than any of our agonies and any of our sufferings that we suffer in this world. By which we may say what prophet Habakkuk said in such a way, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the, pr the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the falls, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take my joy in the Lord, in the, in the God of my salvation. That's the power of Christian joy. We can live above our circumstances. Fourth, various trials. Peter used this word various, which in Greek is poikilos. Say with me, poikilos. Yeah, very interesting word. We'll get there. And it means variegated, many colored. So what he's trying to say is, you know what? Trials comes in different ways, in different sizes, in different forms, in different timings. And we know that. So we know that even if we want, let's say, we want this one battle. And even, if, even if we solve this great sufferings or solve this trial, that doesn't mean that you can now rest forever. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can disarm yourself. Okay, I'm done with my, all my trials. No, another trial will come at you. So you should be alert because another trial will come. Trials in our lives are like unending waves at the seashore. But here's what's fascinating that I found because Peter used the same word, poikilos, in chapter four, verse 10, it goes like this. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied or poikilos grace. But Peter is using this word to describe God's grace. Meaning that, what what's that mean? Like God's grace is also multifaceted. Faceted. God's grace can also come in different ways, different sizes, different timings. And it's all, always you know, comes to us you know, and given to us sufficiently, timely, perfectly by which you will overcome evil with his power and good. God's grace is poikilous. And it's always sufficient. Amen? And fifth, trials can test the genuineness of your faith. Look at verse 7. It says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here the word tested means proved and tried so that you can reveal if it's real. And I want to ask you a question. It's a very important question. And I want you to ask yourself honestly, is my faith real? Think about this. Is my faith real? Once a lad came to Jonathan Edward and asked him, Sir, how do I know if my faith is real? He answered, you will know it once you face big trouble. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. Too many Christians believe that they have faith. But how do you really know if it's real faith or fake faith? It will be proven when your life is tossed by a storm. And at that very moment, you'll know what you really believe. In this verse, Peter used the image of gold tested by fire. You see, a goldsmith would put the gold into this smelting furnace and the reason doing it is not to waste it, you know, why he would waste this precious gold. But his intention is to purify it because once you put this precious gold into the fire, it can remove the cheap impurities. It can make the gold pure and make it more valuable. And I hear that Eastern goldsmith, they kept the metal and the fire until he can see his face on it. So does the Lord, I'm sure, he keeps us in the furnace. He keeps us in the trials and fire until we will reflect God's beauty, God's image, God's glory of Jesus Christ. And in the Bible, we find Job as an icon of trials. In a day, you know, in one day, he lost all his 10 children, all his fortune. He was a great you know, rich guy back in those days. He lost everything. He even lost his health. 
all of which were approved by God, according to the scripture. And look at what he says at the beginning of chapter 23. He says, today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. So basically, Job is saying here, God, I don't understand. Where are you? Why this is happening? I can't really understand. Why? Where are you taking me? But look at what he says after this. He says, but he knows the way that I take. Meaning, even though I don't see it, Lord, even though I can't really feel, feel it, even though I'm dying in my misery right now, but I, I still trust in you. And I believe you are holding my hands and you are leading my pathway. And then he says, when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. As we know, Job's life was bombarded by this awful, terrible trials, and yet somehow he believed that all his sufferings were the refiner's fire, which would help him to come forth like gold that can reflect God's beauty and glory, and we know that he did it. Amazing. And speaking of gold, Peter says, your faith is incomparable with gold. You see, gold is one of the most durable and valuable materials or substances on this planet. Yet Peter says, they will perish, though it is tested by fire, though it can, gold can be beautified and purified, but eventually it will be gone, it will be perished. Just like anything else in this creation, created things. The entire creation is on its way toward final destruction but not in the case of your faith. Your faith will stand strong until Jesus Christ comes again because at the judgment, Jesus will require nothing else from you but your faith. One day you will stand before Jesus and he will not ask anything. Where, how many churches you, you, you planted? How many souls you, you saved? You know, how big was your you know, how, what was your scare fit in your house? How many cars did you drive? He won't ask any of these things. One question he will ask, is your faith real or fake? Do you really believe me or believe something else? Do you really worship me or you worship something else? Let's remember your salvation is only like, it's solemnly depend, dependent on your faith, nothing else. It's not about you coming to the church every Sunday. It's not about how much you tithe. It's not really about how much you serve in the name of the Lord. That's the, just the secondary thing. The primary is, is your faith real? Because we can do all these things for being glory, right? But Jesus will ask you, is your faith real? Period. That's why your trials today can serve as a blessing. Even it can be a source of your joy because your trials, think about this, can test, prove, refine, and strengthen your faith to make it pure, real, alive, robust, genuine, by which you will have an ultimate victory of salvation. If your faith is real, right, through this fire, you know, you can have this ultimate salvation resulting in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So why not? We can be joyful because of these trials. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Let me summarize what you have heard so far. In verses 6 and 7, you heard you know, Peter placing two unmatching words together in the same verse, and rejoicing and grieving. And Christians can have reasons to be grieving. You know, yes, our life can be bombarded by sufferings, 
living in pain. And yet, we also have a reason to be joyful because number one, our trials only last for a little while. Once Jesus comes again, all our pains and wounds and our tears will be washed away. It's there just for a season. It's temporal in light of eternity. Number two, we rejoice because God allows trials not to harm you, but to train you for his purposes. We may not understand fully why God allowed this suffering in my life, but we still can look up, look ahead, and keep trusting God that God is always good. God is always right, and he's making a way for his purpose for you. Number three, our trials are heavy and painful, no doubt about it. But the joy that comes from our Lord is way heavier and greater than our sufferings. That's the power of Christian joy. Number four, trials can come in various poikilous ways. But in the meantime, the grace also comes in poikilous way by which we re rejoice. Number five, we rejoice in our trials because trials can test and prove the genuineness of our faith. And having a real faith is fundamentally important because we are saved by our faith alone. Amen? So, that's what verse 6 and 7 says. And here comes the really important question. So, how we can apply the scripture to our church? Why, God? Why, why do you think? Why do we think, God? has given us this particular word when our church has to make a big decision. What do we hear from this and how we can apply to our church now? First and foremost, I believe God is challenging us and encouraging our church to prove our faith. Smith Sheffield, I love you guys. But let me ask you, what do you believe? Do you really believe in me? Is your faith in me real? Or do you believe that you believe? Our real faith will be proven by our faithfulness. I love this word, faithfulness, faithfulness. <laughs> okay? Faithfulness means it's full of our faith. We being faithful to Jesus. We being faithful to his words. We being faithful to his promises. We stand up for Jesus. We speak up for the truth. And we share the gospel and be willing to be sacrificed, willing to pay the cost. That's what we can learn from the first audience who received this letter for the first time. They were first generation Gentile Christians, like I said last Sunday. They were facing sufferings and persecutions, not because of their faith. They could have kept their faith behind their doors, but they were persecuted because of their faithfulness to their faith in Jesus. Because of their faithfulness, they were abandoned by society and even by their own people. They became aliens and exiles. They paid the price. They paid the cost of discipleship. So these people, Peter is encouraging them, hey, you know what, person? He's not just saying persevere, my friends. He's saying rejoice, my friends. Don't lose your joy in the Lord because you have reasons to be joyful no matter how crazy the world is. So keep up the good work. Hold on to your faith and be faithful to the Lord to the end. So my prayer for our church, not only as you know, body of Christ, but as for you individual Christians, we must be faithful Christians. You know, because of our faithfulness, you see the map? <laughs> That's us, okay? You know, First Peter is given to us, the believers, dispersed in Great Falls, Potomac Falls, Sterling, Lisburg, Silver Spring, Maryland. <laughs> That's us. And at the time of escalating challenges externally and internally, and we are willing to identify ourselves as aliens and exiles, because we truly believe our Christ will come again. And we have to see all this in the light of eternity. And be willing to be in this, you know, we can be rejoiceful. Amen? No matter what's happening. So I want to close today's message 
with Peter's words that he said at the end of his letter in chapter five. And, and this actually this the scripture that I want to share with you as a rep album is also one of the favorite scriptures that our Peter favorite uh, from which I preached at his funeral service two years ago. And it goes like this, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. God, here we are asking for your great mercy to be upon us. Help us to be really born again, Lord, who may have this living hope in and through our reason, Lord, who may fix our eyes unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Oh, Lord, we know that there are challenges coming at us everywhere. We are walking through the fire. It seems like we are we, the fire is coming at us every moment in our lives, externally and internally, Lord. So Holy Spirit, please protect us, guide us, and lead us so that we will win this battle, not because we are, but because who you are, and by your help and grace, and help us to increase our faith, make it alive, you know, make it genuine, make it authentic, make it real, make it you know, lively, Lord. Meaning that we will faithful to you, Lord. We'll be faithful to your promise. We'll be faithful to this name, Jesus, no matter what, because the name that we hold on to, you know, already conquered the world, and you will come again to judge the living and the right. We'll ask one question to each one of us, to each church, individual church. Do you really believe me? I gave all for you, for your salvation. Did you give all yourself for my sake? The Lord, have mercy upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.